Holy cow, what was that? A, a, a meteorite? A bolide? What was that? Holy cow, as you see right there, we got a lot of fireworks in the sky. It's Rocktober, and I'm Stargazer Mark with you. So glad you joined us on the American Space Museum Staying Star Curious Program, where today we're going to have an episode about, you see something in the sky like this bright, bright uh, meteor that is called a bolide because it exploded as it entered the Earth's atmosphere. Very dramatic and rare to see, but not all these things are so easy to understand what they are. You might see an object that moves slowly and wonder, hmm, is that an airplane? Is that a satellite? Or is that a UFO? Well, stay tuned here and stay curious because we're going to explain to you a little checklist to remind you of when you see an object, just like I always do, you roll off a few little criteria there to get to a decision of exactly what it was. Well, this is a great time of year to get outside. It's October. The, the Most of our country is experiencing cooler weather and the fall colors. And you just get out on your lawn chair with your favorite beverage. Have your red flashlight with you so that you can read your star chart that I've set to the appropriate day in October at the time, 8 o'clock at night. And this is what we're seeing in the sky. And surprisingly enough, the Milky Way is as prominent now as any time of the year. It is spanning almost directly overhead when it gets dark. And as the night wears on, the Earth is moving to the east. Stars are moving to the west. The Milky Way arcs over dramatically. It's a great time to see it. Uh, so the next phase of the moon that's new after we get through the full moon phase coming up here in October and our hunter's moon, then you'll be able to see one last swan song of the Milky Way. So get out and see that. But there's also because we're outside enjoying maybe a campfire, maybe you enjoy walks at this time of year because it was too hot in the summertime. You're going to see some things in the sky, and you're going to see not uh, all starry things. You might see something like this. As I say hello to Marty Winkle, my cameraman, co-producer, run the Streamlabs program here. Marty, you've seen this a few times on the beaches around here where you're seeing uh, a ray go all the way from, this is looking east, so this ray went all the way across the sky and and shows up like this we call it anti-crepuscular rays crepuscular rays like think of crepes crepuscular rays uh, are those rays that you see near the sun where the clouds below might be illuminating a shadow into the sky with these beautiful rays coming out of it uh, this you don't see so frequently where it's, it's anti-crepuscular it went all the way 380 degrees across from horizon to horizon to show up like that over the Atlantic Ocean. And no, this is a beautiful sight by itself. You get some people walking in the foreground and bingo, you have a more dramatic photograph. So when you see something in the sky, you want to know a couple of things. How bright is it? What direction is it going? And how fast is it going? And we have a deduction chart for that uh, here. And, uh, oops, I didn't know how to identify a chart. We can't see that at the bottom too good, Marty. But uh, to identify an object in the sky, there we go. Uh, the, the first is, is it really high up? Uh, is it really big? Okay. And if it is really big, uh, you look at the left is how bright is it? Well, that could be the sun or the moon. All right. But is it moving is the next question, all right? And if it moves, um, I'm handicapped here, Marty. I didn't print that out for me, and I should have. Uh, is it quickly? It's too small for, you. It's too small for him to read. Uh, so is it moving quickly? If it's not moving, uh, then it could it's probably a star, all right? Uh, but if it moves uh, over the course of the next few nights from its position where it was, then it's probably a comet, all right? 
but if it moves, uh, uh, then you go to the other side. Is it is it moving fast? Yes, it's moving fast. Is it bright? Yes. Uh, and then is it super bright? Well, if it moves fast quickly, it's gone within seconds, it's definitely a meteor. All right. And if it becomes super bright, it's a bolide or a fireball like we have in our pictures uh, right here. That's definitely a bolide. A bolide is when no matter how big the meteor is or the meteoroid, it uh, explodes. Uh, so this is maybe the size of a pea. A regular meteor that you see is only going to be the size of a grain of sand. It quickly burns up. So you know that it is a cosmic particle. They are meteor meteoroids when they're in space. They're meteors when they fall through the atmosphere and they're meteorites when you hold one in your hand. So, but if it doesn't blow up or disappear, then it is an aircraft most likely. Or it could be the International Space Station or an artificial satellite. What distinguishes you from an aircraft is the blinking lights. You're going to see a red, white, and green light on an airplane. Uh, that tells you uh, one's on the tail, one's on the rudder, one's underneath it, one's on the wings, I mean, one's on the, the tail. Uh, so if you see these lights, that's the first thing you want to know if it's a satellite or an airplane. You look for the blinking lights on it. If there's no blinking lights, and it's moving steadily in the same direction, chances are you're looking at an, inter, uh, an artificial satellite. And if it's particularly bright, that could be the International Space Station. So the apparent magnitude of objects is what an arbitrary scale that we use in the sky to say, how bright was this bolide behind me here, Marty? How bright was that to describe it to you? And, and uh, so you would compare it to the brightness of the other stars around it. This happens to be going through Orion the Hunter. I can see uh, the, uh, the three stars of the belt and the, and the sword dangling off the edge there. And the bright star in the middle, that's Betelgeuse, and that's a first magnitude star. So this bolide was way, way bright. Well, there's an arbitrary scale called magnitude, where first magnitude is two and a half times brighter than second magnitude. Or if you go from top to bottom, uh, first magnitude, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. Sixth is the faintest magnitude that we can see with our naked eyes. It is 100 times fainter than first magnitude. Okay, so this is there's a big wide range of brightness here. But it's how we amateur astronomers talk is, oh, it was it, it, it had to be a, a minus three or four uh, talking about this bright meteor here because the minus values are for the brightest stars in the sky. A handful of them uh, we go brighter. But this logar logarithm is is a first magnitude is two point five times brighter than second magnitude this two point times uh, dimmer brighter than third magnitude. So from first to third is six times uh, in brightness or dimness, depending on which way you go there. The other thing that you want to know, how bright it is, what direction was it going? How high in the sky was it? All right. That's where the sky becomes like a protractor, where directly overhead or zenith is 90 degrees and your horizons are zero. That's why I said the, the, the moon is only a half a degree across. So you could stack 180 moons from the east horizon to overhead and another 180 moons from overhead to the western horizon. Incredible as it seems, the moon is not that big in our sky. And your hands are good to figure out these distances involved because you might look on your app for the International Space Station that it is coming overhead and it'll be 40 degrees above the horizon when at its uh, brightest. Well, if you know that 90 degrees is directly overhead, 45 degrees is halfway from overhead to the horizon. So 40 degrees is going to be about halfway up from the horizon or halfway down from the zenith. 
That's how we figure out things in astronomy and talk to each other. But your little finger at arm's length is one degree. Your scout sign th uh, three fingers is about five degrees. A clenched fist is 10 degrees. And your fingers like that are 15 degrees. And there you have the Big Dipper to give you some ratios. The pointer stars there are five degrees apart and the bowl at the top is 15 and the whole Big Dipper is 25 degrees. These are very good to have in your head to remember when you're stargazing. And like I said, you might, uh, uh, it might say that the Hubble telescope is visible, you know, and uh, it starts out at 10 degrees above the horizon and gets as high as 60 degrees and then goes back down to 10. Well, that's pretty high up, so you can see it very well when anything is above, oh, 10 degrees above the horizon, you're gonna see it pretty easily. Again, how to identify that object in the sky. So what are these objects that we're streaking by? A time exposure photograph of about 30 seconds is the length to show you how they streaked across the sky during that time frame as the fixed stars in the background stayed still on probably a 30 second exposure. These are Starlink satellites going across the sky. All right. Isn't that incredible to think about uh, that you can photograph these very easily. I've had a hard time seeing them because where we live in Florida here, the sky's got to be uh, uh, sort of dark. And in fact, the brightness of these is usually only second magnitude or third magnitude. So they're not the bright, as the brightest stars, first magnitude and, and, and minus figures there a little bit. But you'll know them when you see them because they're clustered together. And the time to see these are the two or three days after a SpaceX launch here on our Florida coast as they are closer to the Earth then and then start spreading away. There's that big bow light again in Orion. What a beautiful shot that is. So what are the magnitudes of the brightest objects in the sky? Well, the naked eye limit, our bar graph here is apparent magnitude, we call it, from zero to sixth magnitude. Venus is the brightest uh, star-like object in the sky, and that goes about minus four magnitude. Cirrus, the brightest star, star is minus one magnitude and between Venus and Cirrus you'll find uh, Jupiter and uh, Saturn and Mars at their brightest. The full moon is about minus 12 and the sun is minus 27 magnitude on this scale and the Hubble telescope sees all the way out to about plus 27 magnitude. The Webb telescope a little bit beyond that in the 30 magnitude. Your backyard telescope, you're going to see around the 10th magnitude, uh, stars that we cannot see with the naked eye. There are some animals, like the owl, whose eyes are bigger and uh, can actually see down to about 8th magnitude, where the limit of the human eye is 6th magnitude. Well, how many stars would that be that we're seeing in, in the sky then? Uh, at these different magnitudes as we're looking up and looking at the sky. Well, you would have, there are only about one star that's minus magnitude. That is, um, of course, Cirrus. Three stars are about zero magnitude, okay? And those include Vega, which is a bright star right now in the summer triangle of three stars that now are actually the autumn triangle. They're very visible, straddling the Milky Way. Just three stars have zero magnitude. There's eight stars that are plus one magnitude or first magnitude. 26 stars close to Earth, or is that 36, are plus two magnitude. There's about 120 stars that are third magnitude. So not many stars are very bright in our sky. Second magnitude and up, you would easy to see in your backyard, uh, even though it's light polluted. Third magnitude is where it starts falling off. So actually from your light polluted backyard, you can see the third magnitude. So you got 120, uh, 
uh, you have uh, 150. So you got less than 160 stars, can you see, from your backyard in all of the seasons that are above first, uh, third magnitude. Yes, Marty. <clears throat> it seems backwards. You would, I would think that a dimmer light in the sky would be negative. The brighter magnitude would be a high, a positive number. Why does it seem to be backwards? Well, that's a good question, uh, Marty. It, it does defy logic in kind of a way that you would use the big numbers for the brightness in there. <clears throat> but that's not the case. Uh, actually, they, uh, and though this logarithmic uh, scale of magnitude has been massaged over the last three centuries, uh, obviously it's here to stay. <clears throat> but yes, uh, some things don't uh, sound logical, uh, but the lower the number, the brighter the object. And then we get into minus numbers for the moon, the m minus 12 for the moon, minus 26 for the sun, as you see there. So uh, there are only 6,000 stars visible with, from the human eye uh, at, uh, in both um, hemispheres of our sky, north and south, and all the seasons. So that's not that many stars. And that's why the ancients of uh, hundreds of years ago uh, drew them and made their own star charts because they didn't move and they were always the same brightness so they could uh, there are some stars that vary in brightness but very few of them jump a whole magnitude there are some out there that do and this is a whole other branch of astronomy that studies variable stars they're variable for several reasons one the light output could be changing or a companion star is moving and rotating in front of it uh, so that uh, it blocks the light and dims it or it could enhance it and make it brighter. But good question, Marty. But nope, you'd think the bigger the number, the brighter the star. Nope, it's just the opposite. The, 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 the lower the number, the brighter the star. We only have a handful of first magnitude stars and zero magnitude and, and, and Sirius is, is uh, minus magnitude. Venus is always like around magnitude four. Jupiter is brighter than Sirius, the brightest star around magnitude minus two. And again, here are some of the limits. Uh, as you see, the Hale telescope, uh, ground-based telescopes have trouble seeing beyond 30 magnitude. Binoculars, you can see 10th magnitude. So binoculars are a great thing to use uh, uh, when you're stargazing in your backyard. Well, a couple other things that you're going to see. We talked about how dramatic is this to see this uh, 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 crepuscular ray. This is actually the uh, shadow of the clouds on the horizon. The sun has set below the horizon and the shadow is being projected up into space. And it actually hit these uh, uh, serocumulus clouds. And again, the anti-crepuscular rays over a beach. That's the most common place that you're going to see them. And one of my favorite phenomenons is the belt of Venus. <clears throat> now, this is a lot going on here right after sunset looking in the east. The sun is set in the west behind us. And you see that real dark band of a shadow there. That is the Earth's shadow cast into space. And we can get a glimpse of it against the, the, the twilight. And then this pinkish area there is our atmosphere. And uh, historically, the ancient stargazers called it the belt of Venus, as in the goddess Venus, not the planet Venus, but the goddess Venus, because it girdled the whole horizon. And to honor her, they, they, they named this beautiful uh, peachy skin tone uh, phenomenon of twilight called the belt of Venus. Now, another interpretation for the word belt in Roman times is brazier. So they're actually talking about the bra of Venus when you talk about seeing the belt of Venus. So it's very pretty and you can see it almost every clear sunset and every sunset is different. Of course, you're not, you're looking into the east now where the sun rises and the sunset behind you uh, spans the whole 
creates this belt of Venus around the Earth's uh, circumference of the horizon. And a beautiful shot uh, that I took of the uh, Kennedy Visitors Complex across the Indian River. That is Orion the Hunter again with the three stars up and down of its belt. Two stars to the left are its shoulders. Two stars to the right are its knees. And you never know what kind of sky you can get until you, you, you look for it uh, in the uh, uh, twilight. Uh, these shots are best done with a tripod. But you could get a satellite going across there or a uh, a plane that, that would give you a beautiful sight. Or you can see a bunch of satellites going across in a time exposure photograph. Uh, like one of my astronomy friends did. That is a globular cluster in the center uh, of about a, about like looking through a 200, maybe 150 millimeter lens of the sky. Uh, this is not, uh, you can see the uh, big ball of the uh, M13 in Hercules, which is right now high above the western horizon as we set. This is where we talk about these Starlink satellites being launched on a frequent basis. This is what they do to astrophotography, uh, to even backyard astronomers on there. So, so get outside and get you a little sunshine uh, uh, for the evening and then stay out there uh, and get you some moonlight or, or starlight if the moon's not out. And get you some starlight. It's, it's, it's beautiful to soak it in. Think about this. When you see starlight, you're seeing the color of the star. That is the wavelength property of light. And the star image is hitting, actually making an impression on the back of your eyeball. That is the solid property of light. It has a dual nature light does. It acts like a wavelength and it acts like a particle. So when you're looking at stars and you see the colors, that light actually does hit the back of your retina, enters your light and registers as such. So, boy, Marty, I'd love to see a meteor blow up like this. I've maybe seen five or six of them in my 50 years of stargazing. But once you do, you never forget it. And you hope that you had a camera uh, open uh, at the time when it did happen. So, uh, and uh, thank you all for watching today on our Stay Star Curious segment of Stay Curious. Marty, thank you for a Streamlabs production today. And uh, until the next time that we meet, I'm Mark Marquette saying, please come and visit our museum or look up at the stars to bridge the space between us.